Hello to everyone. I am Sarah Ramaya, Curriculum Designer at ASRM. Thank you for accepting this invitation and welcome to the ASRM webinar titled ASRM Patient Management and Clinical Recommendations During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Joining us are panelists, Dr. Catherine Rakowski, President of ASRM and Chair of the ASRM COVID-19 Task Force. Dr. Peter Schlegel, Immediate Past President of ASRM. Dr. Kevin Duty, Immediate Past President of SART. And moderating the Q&A session is Dr. Ricardo Aziz, Chief Executive Officer of ASRM. Before we begin, please note, all attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type your questions in the question chat window at the bottom of your gray toolbar at any time. All questions will, will be moderated through this window. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notification. To introduce our speakers today, I will turn this webinar over to Dr. Katherine Rakowski. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, as Sarah said, we have uh, myself as the first speaker and then Dr. Schlegel followed by uh, Dr. Doody. So I'd first like to very much welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, this is the first, uh, oh, I don't have any financial disclosures of any sort. So this um, webinar is really the first of what we hope to be many for our society. This is a particularly poignant webinar in light of the uh, really unexpected challenges that we're all facing as professionals and also as uh, society members. It's a critical time uh, in the world and we really, as a community of professionals, really need to come together, stay together. Uh, as we all know, a community is really as, only as strong as its individual members are. So I really, uh, again, very much welcome everybody. I hope that by holding um, a webinar such as this, we'll all feel a little bit less isolated and more connected during these really, really substantially challenging times. So as I mentioned, I have with me today Dr. Schlegel. Um, so what I will be, will be doing is, um, first of all, I will be discussing the uh, uh, COVID, ASRM Task Force, COVID-19 Task Force recommendations. And then uh, following this, Dr. Schlegel will uh, talk, and he will be talking particularly about the New York perspective and giving a, sort of a, a more global perspective, not global in the global sense, but nationally, of um, the extent of this viral uh, pandemic. And then following Dr. Schlegel, Dr. Kevin Doody will be talking with us. Uh, Dr. Kevin Doody will be talking about SART messaging um, with respect to messaging both to providers and patients. So, and then following that, we're going to have a question and answer session. This will be moderated by our CEO, Dr. Uh, Ricardo Aziz. And then finally, um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to reflect on the way forward. So let's proceed to uh, talking a little bit about um, the task force itself. So before I start discussing this, I really would like to acknowledge and thank every member of the task force. Uh, there's been tremendous amount of commitment to trying to write a, gu a guidance document with recommendations that we really feel are the right thing to do and to help guide uh, members of our society during this terrible time. This task force is comprised of experts from the ASRM and from our affiliate societies and groups. Uh, we also have a few other members from the outside that have been very much um, helpful in uh, drawing up these guidelines. We've really um, invested a significant e effort in this endeavor um, in generating the recommendations and guidance to our reproductive health practitioners and their uh, patients during this unprecedented time. We've tried to base our recommendations on the best and most current data available. Uh, we all know that the times are very fluid, things are changing almost day to day. Um, and this is why, as you know, we're going to be updating our guidance document um, every two weeks at the absolute least. 
So we've um, already published two documents. Uh, we've published the recommendations, which came out on March the 17th. And then, uh, true to our word, we said we'd uh, publish an update uh, within two weeks, and we did so on March the 30th. So uh, hopefully you've all um, seen these documents. They're on the ASRM website if you've not seen them. Um, the one on the left uh, is the patient management and clinical recommendations during the coronavirus. And the one on the right is our first um, update, update number one, which is your note um, is uh, current from, from March the 30th through April the 13th. And we'll be updating this again as update number two on or prior to April the 13th. So every two weeks we're planning on, as I mentioned, on, on doing an update of these uh, uh, recommendations. So what are the underpinnings of the recommendations? And we really um, spent a huge amount of time really think, thinking about what really is going to guide the recommendations of our recommendations. And the very first thing that really came to mind, and I think we'd all agree, is guarding the health and the safety of our patients and our staff. That should be the number one priority, we felt. Number two, we felt uh, we needed to be socially responsible and consider um, conserving the critically needed healthcare resources. We all know what's going on in New York and we'll hear much more about this from Dr. Schlegel. Things are really bad there. And this is, as the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo said, in some respects, New York is the canary in the coal mine. And unfortunately, it's quite likely that what's happening in uh, New York today may well happen in other states in the nation going forward. And we already see hotspots such as in Florida and Louisiana. So then in addition to guarding the health and safety of our patients and our staff and helping to conserve critically needed healthcare resources, we also felt that our guidance should be guided by recognizing our social and community responsibility. Um, in, in order for all these three things to come together, and only if they are together combined, can we really contribute to uh, what we refer to as flattening the curve. And we all have seen this, um, this graph, and I just show it here very quickly. Uh, each one of us counts in this. Uh, we've heard this from the epidemiologists. We've heard it from um, Dr. Fauci, who's talked at length about this on the White House um, podcasts and um, updates on a daily basis. And you can see that the red curve without protective measures, the number of cases gets much higher than it does with the blue curve where we're implementing protective measures. And you can see the hash, the dotted line here, is the line at which we, above which we start losing the ability to provide appropriate care for patients because the healthcare system reaches capacity. And so this flattening of the curve, as we now know, and we've been told this over and over again by so many different people, can only really be achieved if we all do social isolating, that we shelter in place and we stay within ourselves, within our families, and don't go outside, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to control the transmission rate of this dreadful, dreadful disease. And I want to acknowledge here David Holtgrave um, from the University of Alabama who prepared this slide. So what, what about then the key recommendations in our task, the original task force recommendation and guidance, which, as I say, was published on March the 17th? So the first uh, recommendation was that we really feel, uh, felt and we feel today that um, new tra treatment cycles should be suspended. And we talk, we're referring here, of course, to ovulation induction, IUI, um, and IVF as well. Uh, we recommend, secondly, strongly consider cancelling or transfers. Thirdly, complete care of in-cycle patients and care for those requiring urgent stimulation for fertility preservation. Fourthly, uh, we recommend suspending elective surgeries and non-urgent diagnostic procedures. And fifthly, as I mentioned, minimize in-person contact and increase the use of telehealth. And I think we all would agree that we're spending a lot more time on all these electronic communication media, such as Zoom and all the uh, Skype and all the rest of it, and certainly telemedicine and telehealth should be really encouraged in these times. So the detailed recommendations are laid down in this guidance document under the sections risk mitigation and social distancing, uh, patient travel and really controlling patient travel so that there's they, um, really each one of them is playing their part in uh, controlling the rate of transmission. 
Uh, we also have a section on practice management, management of the embryology and andrology laboratories, and then finally, uh, the support of health and well-being of patients and staff. And this last one is really, really important. And when we were, aren't just referring here to uh, uh, trying to help the health of the patients and staff, but we're talking about physical health, but we're talking about the mental health as well. I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Schlegel is going to be telling us more about the stress, the emotional stress that is going on New York, in New York. It's not just in New York, however, it's everybody's feeling enormous stress from this just by virtue of the challenges, the unforeseen challenges that we're all facing that just came up so quickly out of nowhere. So um, the update that we published on March the 30th, we felt um, we needed to clarify some things. And I would, what, would like here to acknowledge a letter that was um, sent to us by the Fertility Practitioners Alliance. This is a group of about 40 practitioners who wrote a letter in response to our original guidance document. And um, in fairness, there were uh, many things in this letter that um, perhaps we didn't clarify very well in our first document. And we tried in this update to really address those. Um, certainly, there was no intention whatsoever not to, to write a clear document. There was a lot to write in a very short time. But first and foremost, very importantly, we were, I think we'll all agree that infertility is a disease. There's no question about that. This, um, Infertility uh, was uh, defined as a disease several years ago. The WHO has, has endorsed that. And I think all of us in the field would agree that it is a disease. Secondly, I think we'd all agree that infertility treatment is not elective. This is, no one has chosen to have infertility and the treatment itself should not be considered not elective. However, elective in this context really we feel and this was reflected in the update that we wrote and published on march the 30th elective in this context we really feel refers generally to a surgery that can be delayed or is considered to be non-urgent and the american college of surgeons that actually defines it in this way and then uh, finally, the, I think the final um, important point to clarify is the issue of urgent versus non-urgent procedures. So I'm sure if you've read our guidance document and read the update, at the moment we're not distinguishing between particular patient categories that might be considered much more urgent than others. For example, diminished ovarian reserve and patients that are on the older side. Um, as things evolve, it is pro quite probable that we will have to and feel um, that it's important to uh, revise the document so that we can take into consideration what we might consider these more um, urgent cases of, of patients going through IVF. But as things stand at the moment, we still stand by um, all patients being considered together um, as being those that should not have new treatments, just again because of uh, particularly the social issues here and really trying as a community and as professionals and you know, our society is 8,000 people. I mean, it's not a small society and each one of us has the responsibility we feel to really flatten the curve and control the transmission rate of this dreadful disease. So the detailed recommendations then of the update really reiterated what um, we said in our first document. So we continue to support the recommendations of March the 17th and I've just gone through those five recommendations with you. We continue to be committed absolutely to return of patient care as soon as we possibly can do that. We continue to emphasize the importance of the safe storage of reproductive tissues. Obviously, this is of paramount importance. We all know that. I don't need to go into the ins and outs of that. Uh, we recommend leveraging telehealth, telemedicine, um, to try to control the number of people that have to walk around um, there's a lot of telehealth way, ways that we can actually undertake telehealth now. And then finally, as I mentioned, continuing to emphasize the enhanced emotional psychological support for patients and staff that are really needed in these unprecedented times. And we have on our task force the chair of the mental health group, um, Anne Malby, and she's been absolutely fantastic in helping advise us in, in how best to do this. And I know that that group is um, putting together much more um, coherent and extensive documents than we mentioned in our guidance document. So the principles that underlie uh, our task force recommendations, I've touched on them, but I really want to sort of bring them to together 
um, in a sort of a much more cohesive form. So the number one principle is the recommendations are based on public health and CDC recommendations for suppression of viral transmission. This virus has a transmission rate. It's high, much, much more contagious, we believe, than any other virus that has occurred so far to date. I believe I'm right in saying that. And so we really have this uh, public responsibility to do this, which is why we are recommending that patients should not undergo new treatments at this point in time when everything is still very much under, out of control in our country. The recommendations then therefore aim at decreasing the risk of the transmission to our patients, staff and physicians and to the population at large. As the pandemic continues, and this is important and we really will stand by this, we're trying to do what we feel is best for the society, for our society, the ASRM, and also society at large. So as the pandemic continues, the task force recognizes that there will be a need to update these recommendations to include how to provide safe patient care in the era of COVID-19. It's very unlikely that um, COVID-19 is going to go away for many months ahead. And we all recognize that all the issues involved in terms of economics, as well as the stresses and strains on the patients themselves in wanting to have treatment for their infertility. And so it's, it's almost certain that we'll be opening our practices at some point when COVID-19 is still a virus and still being transmitted from human to human. And so we're staying on top of this. We're hoping very much that in, not, uh, in the relatively near future, although we have no idea when, we're going to be able to um, loosen the guidance, the recommendations from the ASRM task force so that patients can start new treatment cycles again. So with that, um, I will go ahead and um, a couple of closing remarks. So the impact on individual health, lives and livelihoods is both humbling and terrifying. We all know this and we're really, really feeling it, each one of us, but I'm sure not nearly to the orders of magnitude as what's going on in New York today. And Dr. Schlegel will be picking up the baton in a moment and talking about that. So the ASRM efforts are really focused on how best to help quicken resolution of this pandemic so that we can get back to serving our patients as quickly and as safely as possible. In the few days since we announced our offering of certificate courses free of charge, I'm really, really delighted to say that more than 600 of science people have signed up. And actually, I learned today that it's now more than 650 people, um, members of our society, have signed up to take advantage of this offer. We felt this was the least we could do as a society to, to help people while, while they're not necessarily going to work and they have time um, just to improve their knowledge and also just to give them a perk as members of our society. In addition to that, our government affairs team has been busy discussing what our community needs with policymakers. Dr. Doody is going to be talking more about this, I think, with respect to the SART messaging uh, immediately uh, after uh, Dr. Schlegel has spoken. And then I will just say the obvious, and I say this from my heart, I think people who know me well know that, you know, I don't say things that I don't mean. We are really all in this together, and I really sincerely believe that we will get to the other side, but we've got to stick together on this. We're so much stronger together than we are separately. And I really urge those of you who have questioned whether we, should, we are doing the right thing by stopping the, treat, the new treatments of patients, I really would urge you just to ask yourselves, are you doing the right thing by continuing to see patients as we are here today with still on the upward curve of this dreadful virus? We have got to each do our part to try to control this. So thank you so much. I will now pass things over to uh, Dr. Schlegel. And so Dr. Schlegel, as you know, he's the immediate past president of ASRM. And um, as I mentioned, he is going to be talking with us about the situation in New York and also what's going on nationally. So Peter, welcome. Thanks, Catherine. Let me uh, just back up a little bit in terms of the information we're gonna discuss and go back to some basics and talk a little more about what actually occurs when this disease um, comes through a community. So I have no financial disclosures. So this disease is caused by SARS-CoV-2, a novel coronavirus. It, has, it is an RNA virus with a lipid envelope, and that's very important to how we prevent uh, this disease from transmitting from person to person. Infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus 
causes the disease of COVID-19, just to define what COVID-19 is. It is an illness that typically presents with fever, cough, sore throat, a fairly distinctive loss of taste and smell, as well as shortness of breath, although a wide variety of atypical presentations can occur as well. And certainly when the virus starts to affect a community, we are often as healthcare workers tricked by these patients who come in with, for example, predominant diarrhea and no other symptoms. Similarly, if you look at elderly patients, elderly patients, half of them do not even develop a fever, even with advanced disease. As Catherine alluded to, this is a very insidious disease because the virus has an incubation period of five to 10 days and patients are thought to be most able to transmit virus a couple of days before their symptoms develop. Even after symptoms develop, it may take another four to 11 days before patients develop disease that is so severe that they require hospitalization. All adults can be affected, even though children are relatively unaffected. If we look at the New York City hospital admissions, 38% of those admissions are occurring in individuals who are 18 to 44 years of age. So this is affecting the young. One of the misstatements uh, people often make is, I'm young, I can't get it. You certainly can get it and you can be extremely ill intubated in the hospital with it. Interestingly, it appears to have a male uh, predominance or predilection, 56 to 62 percent of those affected are male. The risk of death does tend to be highest in the elderly and those with comorbidities. We're actually now starting to understand that more advanced disease a little more clearly. It often is associated with a microangiopathic uh, thrombotic tendency, almost like a DIC, but without a bleeding tendency, and it's often associated with high uh, D-dimers. It is spread by droplets as well as contact. Now, the virus typically dies on surfaces within four to 48 hours, but it's important to remember what occurs when you either speak, cough, or sneeze. So the recommendation that people stay six feet apart is based on the fact that droplets that come out just by speaking, and the more loudly that you speak, the farther the droplets go. But even by speaking, droplets will go four and a half feet, coughing at least six feet, and sneezing can really contaminate an entire room. Because the virus has a lipid uh, layer on its outside, it can be easily destroyed with alcohol-based uh, sterilizing agents, as well as hand washing with soap for 20 seconds or more. In most diseases, uh, viral diseases particularly, you would like to avoid viral spread with containment. We lost the opportunity for containment in December. Now our best approaches are mitigation limiting the ongoing spread that occurs of this virus, which again is typically person to person. Social distancing, staying greater than six feet away, staying at home, avoiding large groups are really critical components of this social distancing and mitigation to limit the amount of spread of the disease. Covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze is critical. We found and seen with now decreasing death rates over time that the earlier that you institute dramatic steps throughout the entire population, such as what, March, uh, what was done in March 10th in Washington State, what was done in New York a State in March 20th, and Michigan as well, these are critical steps. If you think about it, you have widespread infection throughout the community even after you institute these steps, it is gonna take a minimum of 10 to 15 days before you see a decrease in disease uh, propagation through the community. So with these steps that were taken in Washington State on March 10th, you're actually able to see flattening of the curve in terms of the amount of disease that spreads. New York State, 
is seeing a continued increase, and in part, that's because the greatest effect of mitigating spread occurred in the New York City areas, and still there are other components of the state where the disease has continued to propagate. Again, exposure to symptoms, to development of disease, five to 10 days, four to 11 days for severe disease, so mitigation effects take up to 15 to 20 days. Community-based spread is difficult to control without highly effective quarantine efforts. And if you look at the curves in terms of death rates, either in China or in Korea, they are the result of dramatic and substantive steps that were taken in a relatively authoritarian areas where people were absolutely prevented from going outside and communicating or interacting with any other person. A good example is a second person who is infected in New York State. This was an individual who is in Westchester County, about 20 miles outside of New York City. Over one weekend, he had over 1,000 contacts, which then had to be quarantined. And out of those 1,000 people, 120 were infected. Current estimates from Iceland and a series of other studies suggest that 18 to 50 percent of the infections actually result in minimal or no symptoms. Our current modelers suggest that up to 33 percent of the New York City population are thought to have been infected and are probably potential asymptomatic carriers. These observations have substantial importance as we think about running a medical practice and bringing apparently healthy individuals in to interact with our other healthcare workers as well as other patients. It outlines just how risky that can be to your other patients. So, Summarizing where we stand in uh, New York State right now, and these data are from this afternoon, total number of cases, 92,000. They now affect every county in New York State. 47,000 of those cases are in New York City alone. And in New York City, there have now been 2,400 deaths. Just to remind you, a week ago in New York City, there were 285 deaths. So that is almost a tenfold increase, and certainly by tomorrow, it will be a tenfold increase. Even at the most capable hospitals, hospitals which have some of the greatest resources of any hospital in the country, we have seen that the morgues become overrun. You don't have enough time to get refrigerated trucks in time. Uh, funeral homes are refusing to accept bodies. This is a dramatic and very sad state of affairs for what we have in one of the most advanced healthcare systems in the world. So, the growth of disease really threatens to overwhelm our healthcare resources, those resources that are available to manage the disease. For one New York uh, hospital system, which cares for about 22 to 24 percent of all New York City uh, COVID positive patients, their baseline ICU capacity was about 400 beds, with a total inpatient capacity of over 3,200 beds. 25 to 30 percent of the patients who are admitted to the hospital will end up in an ICU on a ventilator, often on a ventilator for 10 to 15 days. As of April 2nd, 2020, this institution that had 400 ICU beds has 487 COVID positive patients being ventilated in ICU beds. How did they do that? Well, they estimated that we're going to need 1,100 ICU beds. That means taking step-down units, PACU areas, and every operating room that is not needed for an emergency procedure and converting operating rooms into two bed ICUs. So every operating room can become an ICU because it has an anesthesia machine that could be used as a ventilator. 
an additional ventilator is used for the second patient. It is also required conversion of an ambulatory surgery center to ICU beds. That's provided another ICU uh, series of 100 ICU beds for that system. So if you are in an ambulatory surgery center and you say that my resources are not important for hospitals as a whole, the reality is your ventilator, your resources actually could be helpful as disease overwhelms a community. Converting an adjacent uh, specialty hospital with ORs to ICU beds is also how this hospital has approached the 1,100 bed uh, capacity. Now, there are limitations and risks in disease management, uh, which really are related to specific supply problems. One of the things we recognized to begin with is space was going to be a major problem, particularly space for creation of ICU beds. The next step that we saw in terms of a challenge was actually testing capability. Testing capability for um, the virus basically existed at about 50 tests per day, and it's now been mobilized up to 3,000 tests per day, but that's required all kinds of new machines, new resources, and as you ramp up that quickly, you find that you run out of things like reagents, you run out of nasal swabs. This ramp up in terms of healthcare activity is so dramatic and so rapid that actually we find on a regular basis, we are short of equipment. One of the first areas we were concerned about equipment shortages was in personal protective equipment, particularly N95 masks, but frankly, even surgical masks. We now use 100,000 masks per day in the hospital setting. We're also risky in terms of our ability to have medical personnel to staff these areas, as well as nursing personnel. This has really become an all hands on deck type of situation. We've created pyramidal sort of teams that work in the ICU. So you have an experienced intestivist, the intensivist heads up the entire group. You have senior physicians working underneath him or her, and then you have teams of junior attending physicians, residents, APPs, who basically extend out your ICU capabilities. That's how you can manage all of these ICU beds that, again, were not uh, present immediately in your system. The next area that we ran into supply problems was in ventilators. We have staff who stay up now all night so that they can managed to resource ventilators from China and get them here before we hit the peak of disease activity. What's going to be our next supply uh, chain limitation? We don't know at this point. We think we're a step or two ahead, but frankly, we have thought that we were there before. Cessation of elective surgical procedures really occurred for several reasons. One, we needed the PPE. We couldn't use all of those gowns and masks for procedures that weren't absolutely urgent or emergency procedures. We also needed both the ambulatory surgery as well as the operating rooms, it turns out, for ICUs. And plus, it limited our ability to use staff and deploy them to take care of COVID patients. Stay at home also means cessation of non-urgent office visits. We now have the regular question do we really want to bring a patient in for an office visit? What risks are we exposing them to by doing that? And is that worth the care that we're going to provide? Telemedicine has obviously become the predominant way that we provide care to most of our patients on an ongoing basis. We're fortunate that we actually were well equipped to do telemedicine to begin with. And it was part of our electronic uh, medical system but ramping that up has been critical. Risk of disease transmission is critical when we think about our patients. There's a very high frequency of viral disease in the community. That occurs before you recognize it. By the time you figure out that patients are actually infected, they've infected all of your other patients and staff as well. These asymptomatic periods with viral infectivity are very concerning. Most of my colleagues who are healthcare workers who have become infected 
have gotten infected caring for patients who had apparently non-COVID related disease, like appendicitis or a kidney stone. But it turned out they actually were carrying the virus and transmitted that to healthcare workers. Similarly, some of our patients, unfortunately, particularly younger patients, fail to heed restrictions on disease mitigation. We've had patients come in for fertility evaluation who are febrile, having been exposed to known COVID carriers and thought that because they were young, they couldn't either get the disease or transmit the disease and unfortunately have infected others. Now, what are the effects of COVID-19 uh, during pregnancy? I've got to say that the overall data are quite limited. This survey that was just published this month by uh, Dashrath and AJOG goes over a comparison of COVID-19 to SARS and MERS. Very few cases of pregnancy with SARS or MERS infection have been described. A few more with COVID-19. Clearly, 55 patients does not allow us to adequately describe what the effects this virus is going to have on pregnancy or children. This small analysis did suggest miscarriage or stillbirth in 2% of cases, IUGR in 9%, preterm birth in 43%, and neonatal deaths in 2%. Now, most of the women who were infected were in their third trimester. This is a lower than reported uh, fetal complication, maternal complications than seen from SARS or MERS, but those tended to be very severe diseases as well. There appears to be limited viral transmission to the fetus, but again, data are early. Interestingly, the detection of COVID disease during labor or immediately after labor has become so common in New York City that all laboring patients are now tested at the time of admission. I can tell you that this vasculitis, which is seen with microangiopathic um, thrombosis, occurs in five out of six uh, placentas that have been examined so far. These are very preliminary data, but they suggest concern about having the infection when you're pregnant. In summary, this disease has rapid dissemination uh, throughout the population. New York City may have been uh, further set up for that because of higher population density. If we look at areas like Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, where there's even higher population density than some other regions of New York City, the propagation of disease has been worse. It clearly has a substantial risk of stressing our medical resources. Continued fertility care in this kind of setting clearly carries risk. It carries risk of disease transmission to or amongst patients. It carries disease transmission to your healthcare workers that you employ in your clinics. Risks of using uh, PPE as well as ventilators and convertible medical resources, it could be of critical benefit for treatment of ill patients, is somewhat of an ethical concern if you're providing less than urgent or emergency care. The incompletely defined risks of COVID to the pregnant women are also of concern. That concludes my comments about where we stand in New York City. And I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Duty. Great. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. So I, I, I do have a disclosure in that my wife and I are owners of Care Fertility in Dallas-Fort Worth, and this is a medical practice uh, as well as an ambulatory surgical center and laboratory that has been greatly impacted by COVID-19, as have many of others we know. So my practice is not unique. It's one of 370 um, SART member practices that have been profoundly impacted both by the virus, uh, its effects, and the responses of local governments and the responses of the ASRM uh, COVID-19 task force. I think it's important uh, for everyone to know that SART was represented on the COVID-19 task force and uh, stands behind the guidances that have been um, recommended. In addition, I think what I want to point out is that SART over the last two weeks has really mobilized its resources for uh, both patients and, and member uh, members to navigate the evolving changes that we've needed to handle the crisis. And uh, we can see front and center on SART's um, 
homepage that there is a an alert for for patients. This the purpose is is really to help uh, our patients in understanding the the task force guidance. And then on the bottom, uh, what we see are the links to the AS, ASRM information that is helpful as well, including what Catherine mentioned uh, as far as the no charge for uh, ASRM member embryologists, uh, andrologists, and nurses to complete their certificate courses. So uh, I'd like to start with the, the messaging that we've done for, for patients, and this is very important because patients really um, have have a unique perspective in how this is being handled, and they have a lot of questions. And I'm not saying that questions should necessarily be linked to on your own websites or plagiarized by your nurses but they uh, or, or physicians to help answer these frequently asked questions but I, I think it uh, they can be useful in, in guiding appropriate responses as physicians uh, we we tend to think about things from a medical aspect and and start reached out to our partners to resolve and the mental health professional groups to help us construct answers that take into account the emotional burdens that our that our patients are feeling. Um, and just as an example, uh, the answer to this question, will postponing my care affect my ability to have a child? As a physician, I might answer that. Well, no, there's no evidence that within one or two months, uh, a delay of treatment is really going to have a big impact. But it's important to uh, to recognize that the patients really do have an emotional component to it. They've gone through tremendous grief by the time they've gotten to the place where they're doing an IVF cycle, um, and all of this is is daunting. So you, you might take a chance to look at the answers, the questions that have been asked and the answers. The other question that many of our patients have asked, especially when we're counsel, counseling them with regard to uh, whether or not they should proceed with an embryo transfer that they're, they've been in cycle with is, you know, should I get pregnant, or if I'm subfertile and not necessarily sterile, um, should I be using contraception during this time? And you know, we've we've come out with a, a very clear statement that we're, you know, not saying that women shouldn't get pregnant. We're also not saying that there's no risk. The risk of acquiring the coronavirus in the first trimester, really, as Dr. Schlegel uh, referred to, we're they're not known, and and they're not going to be known for some time. We do know that severe illness can lead to pregnancy complications. Uh, if patients are already pregnant, they should be taking all the precautions to, to reduce their exposure. Uh, obviously, social distancing uh, is the biggest one among them. We also listed for patients uh, some some tips and some and some resources for them that that I think are are quite useful. The resources that we link to or resolve um, is a very uh, active online support community. Um, we, we've also linked to the ASRM's mental health professional group, uh, and they have further links. Uh, but just some ideas for our patients, and, and perhaps are good for us too, uh, limit your use of social media and other sources of news. Uh, use some relaxation or mind, mindfulness applications to, to reduce anxiety. Uh, distract yourself with some non-COVID related topics stay in touch with your support network, et cetera. And then finally, that was for the messaging that we've done for our patients. For our professionals, uh, under the professionals and provider tab, uh, we do have a COVID-19 resource link, uh, and this includes uh, a message to our members, some tips regarding the safety of uh, gametes and embryos, and an account of one of our own, a reproductive endocrinologist from the epicenter, initial exposures in New York. So the message to membership is quite long. I'm not going to go through this. I want to allow some time for questions and answers, but I'd encourage everyone to take the time to, to read it. And again, I'd encourage the embryologist to, to look at what we've come out with in terms of some tips for maintaining the safety of gametes uh, and embryos. Uh, probably not going to be a problem, but recognize that the suppliers of liquid nitrogen are also the typically the suppliers of, of medical gases, including oxygen, and they may be forced to prioritize in the future. Um, it's important to, to uh, uh, think about staggering your embryology staff, whether that's, uh, you know, green team, blue team, or some other method, so that any that you're not at risk of not having people being able to take care of your, your tanks, et cetera. And then finally, I'd uh, encourage everyone to read this 
story from one of our own, uh, Dr. Harry Lyman from New York. Uh, he talks about being in the first containment zone, seeing his friends and colleagues become sick, uh, and having uh, really his uh, whole life upended. It's a very, very powerful story. I will say also that that our uh, message to members is uh, update will be updated periodically. We expect expect a new one to come out tomorrow. So if you've already read the one we have, it's either the new one will be out tomorrow or, or perhaps latest on Monday. And then finally, just to, to tout another link that we have, uh, which is the, the relief package that's, I think, going to be so important for a lot of our practices that are small businesses. Um, so there'll be a webinar tomorrow um, that the ASRM is putting on that will discuss this and bring in some expert, experts to give a lot more detail. Uh, but thank you. I'll be turning it over for questions and answers. The floor is now open for questions. Dr. Ricardo Aziz will be moderating the session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Judy Rukowski and, and Schlegel. That was, uh, uh, that was as always, uh, fascinating. There's a number of questions that our, uh, our audience has uh, sent us and uh, more, more are popping in. So I'm going to start out trying to uh, merge some of the questions. The first one really has to do with the impact of flattening the curve. Uh, if flattening the curve uh, does or does not extend the period at which uh, we are in a pandemic. Uh, uh, and uh, that, of course, will have implications for uh, our uh, recommendations as well as the treatment of our patients. Uh, could, could one of you, maybe uh, Peter, uh, speak to the impact of uh, the flattening the curve on the duration of the pandemic. So Catherine showed kind of the outline of flattening the curve and the concept primarily of flattening the curve is that you just are trying not to overwhelm your healthcare resources. I talked about one of the most capable hospitals uh, in the country, barely being able to deal with um, this crisis 11, 12 days uh, as a peak after severe restrictions were put into place. All non-essential businesses were closed. Everyone was ordered to stay at home. No one travels to work. No one is uh, on the subways. So basically, if you do that, you're dealing with the peak as your greatest concern. If you have a lower peak, you're gonna have a lower tail after that. How long the tail continues really depends on the disease that persists, the amount of viral contamination uh, in the population, and when you go ahead and free people up to get back to normal activities and interaction. Because even a relatively small amount of um, viral contamination in the population spreads extremely quickly. So I don't think we have perfect information on whether you're gonna have a long tail because you flattened the peak, it appears to be a similar period of time. You just don't overwhelm your healthcare resources. Thank you. Um, if uh, that's the case, and maybe the group would like to respond, uh, there are a number of questions about uh, if that is the case and we expect that the pandemic will be with us for certainly weeks, if not months, uh, what is the threshold at which uh, the recommendations may begin to change. Uh, how do we begin to address uh, long-term the care of uh, infertility patients? Interesting as we look at models, and you know the modeling people are kind of math nerds who sit and put together a whole series of inputs in terms of how quickly disease is spreading, how much disease is present within the population, and use that to predict out where we go. So obviously you've got to be at a low enough disease prevalence to get people back to activity, and that includes routine care visits, it includes having patients come in and starting treatments like fertility treatments, perhaps more specifics. If I could just weigh in a little bit as well, Peter, if I may. Um, so the, uh, the ASRM is really uh, very aware of this issue of when we can return to work and when we can start treating patients again. Um, our society is working very closely with other organizations and of course looking and watching the CDC guidelines on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we're not siloed in, in our, our guidance of staying at home. This is, this is becoming 
the, the norm. As Peter says, um, in New York, it has been the norm now for, I think, probably well over a week, people have not been allowed to leave their homes. And I, I believe I'm right in saying now that it's well over 50% of the states that this is the case. Um, some states it's not. But nevertheless, um, the, the, the whole idea here is just to get back to this business of flattening the curve and how long this might go on. I think it probably is fair to say from the reading that I've done that flattening the curve will extend the duration of the, the disease being in the public domain. But again, is it worth losing lives because you're overtaxing the hospital systems in order to you know, allow people to continue to do medical procedures? Or should we all be thinking about what is best for society as a whole? And I don't, I, I don't, I hate to keep harping on this, but I have a very personal opinion about this. I think we should be doing what's right for society. Yes, but and I'd like to echo that. Uh, but I think it's important to bring out that the task force is committed to revisiting this every two weeks. And as Absolutely. things change, you, you can take all the models that are out there and, and we really don't know. And it may be, right. it may be that it may be a localized, uh, you know, we it may be a localized um, you know, return to, to, to function because places like New York that have a higher peak, they may they may take longer to get back to, to where it's not going to overwhelm their system. So I think that's the important point is that we're looking at that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a very important point and valid point, Kevin. Um, we know that the, the penetrance of the disease at the moment is very different from one state to another. The whole question is, how is that going to look in two weeks or a month's time? Yeah. Are these states that at the moment have very low pen penetrance, are they going to continue to have very low penetrance? Or are they going to be in the situation that New York is now in, that Louisiana is threatening to be in, Florida is uh, threatening to be in? And the, the, the big, one of the biggest problems here is we simply don't know. We do not have experience with managing something of this enormity. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> there is a question, actually, a couple of different questions that uh, ask the same uh, in a different way. Uh, so there are still practices who remain open. There are larger practices who are still seeing patients. And the question then becomes from the uh, from the attendees: one, why should they then follow guidance if other practices are not doing so? And two. Uh, is that uh, uh, is is that issue uh, something that uh, SART is going to address or not? Can I, so I'll take that one. So um, yeah, some some folks may want to engage in risky behavior. Doesn't mean that we all should. So there is no safe way. There is no way to guarantee complete safety, right? So um, hand washing is not going to do it. Uh, hand sanitizer at the front is not going to do it. Taking people's temperature temperature is not going to do it. Uh, this is a virus, as, as Peter mentioned, it, it, people breathe it out before they're symptomatic and other people can breathe it in. And it can be in a closed air environment. It can be there for 30 minutes or, or even longer. Um, so so can't make it safe. Um, why, why good, you know, we should do it because we want to protect our patients. We want to protect our staff. We want to protect our families, and and that's why we should do it. Um, and and you're right. There are some there are some clinics that that don't appear to be um, viewing it as much of with as much concern as a lot of us do. Will they be kicked out of SART? I I, 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 I what I would say is this is not a guideline that has gone through the normal ASRM process. And so yes, SART members do have to uh, abide by. ASRM guidelines, SART guidelines, and at the present time, uh, we're not we're not looking at kicking people out. No, I'm not saying that this is something that they should be doing by any means. Thank you. There are a number of questions about uh, specifics uh, in uh, management. Uh, for example, uh, we discussed converting uh, rooms. Peter, you discussed converting the rooms to uh, to ICU. Uh, is there a ways that ambulatory centers uh, uh, and other uh, similar facilities that many of our uh, medical practices have, uh, can they be used for ICUs in the community uh, if their local hospitals uh, become overwhelmed? Yes, absolutely they can. So the ambulatory surgery center that I was referring to 
is actually a separate 12 operating room plus um, endoscopy uh, suites, I think 20 endoscopy suites. And if you take that and you take the recovery areas for that modest size ambulatory surgery center, it could be completely converted to an ICU type setting. Now the challenge with that is you need the resources of a hospital in terms of ventilators, ICU materials, medications that you wouldn't routinely have there to support it. So it's possible to do, but it would require a very close collaboration with an inpatient hospital setting. But again, the ambulatory surgery center I'm referring to is a completely independent uh, building and completely independent site that functioned completely separately from an inpatient hospital. Yes, and I would echo that. And my ambulatory surgical center in Texas has two ORs and the state has reached out. They're requiring independent ASCs to register their ventilators because they know that there's a good likelihood that they're gonna have to repurpose them. Maybe not in our ASC, but take the ventilators. So uh, another question that comes from our uh, members, of course, it has to do with the financial impact around clinics uh, uh, not seeing patients, and of course, patients not receiving the care. What what uh, advice or counsel can we provide uh, to those uh, practices who are not receiving, obviously, uh, revenues, but obviously have overhead costs and other expenses? So I'll, I'll just tackle that to um, to begin the conversation. Um, so as I mentioned, our, our government, our governmental team is working with policymakers um, to try to get them to uh, help them to understand the predicaments of our community and help to guide how our community can tap into the resources that might be available uh, since Trump has passed the. Uh, what, however many trillion dollar bill, two trillion dollar bill. Um, also, as Kevin mentioned, tomorrow we are holding a webinar where we're going to have some experts to help discuss um, the ins and outs of the availability of funds in this bill that's being passed. I don't know, Kevin, do you have any other information you want to add on that? No, no. I, I think I think it'll be a very valuable webinar. I'm 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 ready to hear what the panelists say. Yeah. 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 Well, there's at least three areas where physician groups and hospital physician groups have been able to uh, safeguard themselves from a financial standpoint. There is no physician group, um, physician practice, or hospital that is going to get through this entire uh, period of time unscathed. Our physician group uh, is basically looking at about a 20% hit, which is almost $200 million. How do you cover that? Well, we have the potential for Medicare monies to be advanced. That doesn't exist as an opportunity um, for IVF clinics or many other uh, physician settings. But extending lines of credit, looking to the next CARES package and what can be obtained from that, as well as the small business loans that you can get from the first CARES package are all opportunities to provide extension. I think most of us look at this as a two or three month process. You have to you have to weather your cash flow, manage that appropriately, and then look to the growth that you'll have after that. There's a series of questions that I think uh, uh, we can uh, put together concerning uh, both uh, viral load uh, and uh, uh, viral of, uh, infection of fetal tissues in uh, patients who have had a, a, a loss as well as how to handle if uh, the uh, tissues of patients uh, who are infected with COVID. What are the special considerations uh, in dealing with that uh, for gamete uh, storage and so on? Sure. So in terms of the patient interaction, I'll let Catherine talk about um, some of the management of gametes and embryos as well. But if we consider uh, where you get your greatest viral load it tends to come from the aura digestive tract. So the greatest risk is, again, somebody coughs, sneezes, you have to intubate someone. Fortunately, that's not something we typically have to do in our practices. The amount of viral load and its infectivity is not very well sorted out. It's pretty clear that your droplet load and your risk of infection goes up if you're within six feet in presence of someone who is COVID positive 
for more than 10 minutes. Again, up until that time, it's not clear what your absolute uh, threshold is. So most of us have taken the precaution of wearing N95 masks in the presence of any COVID positive patient in New York City right now. Everyone is assumed to be COVID positive. Very good. So and with respect to uh, gamete and tissue storage, um, since we simply do not know whether the virus survives in liquid nitrogen and we do not know whether there is transmission um, from one specimen that might be infected to another that is either in vapors or in liquid nitrogen. Our recommendation is just simply to handle the samples from a COVID positive patient in exactly the same way as one would handle samples from a patient that's zero uh, positive for another infectious disease since we don't know. And obviously universal precautions absolutely must be um, used at, at all times when handling these specimens. Time will tell. We just simply don't know at the moment. Will the availability of uh, testing uh, and uh, more and expanded uh, testing for COVID-19 and for the coronavirus, uh, novel coronavirus, will that impact uh, the recommendations uh, of ASRM uh, and will that impact the care uh, that we are able to provide patients? Well, certainly having more knowledge is helpful. Um, and you know the, the current tests we're predominantly using are RT-PCR based tests. So they're finicky tests to some degree because you've got to amplify up the RNA and the virus to detect it. Um, and again, detection and the newer tests uh, appear to be quite good, up to 99% uh, percent specificity, 95% uh, specificity. Unfortunately, we've seen a number of patients who clearly are at clinically very high risk for COVID uh, infection, and they have multiple negative tests before you actually get a positive test. So yes, more information would absolutely be helpful, but just like we did with HIV as a disease, you end up needing to have universal precautions when you have a high prevalence of disease within the population. And to the question as to whether the guidance documents uh, might be revised as testing's increased, I mean, this is a, tr a tricky question because my understanding is that the need for testing is largely to identify where there are hot pockets, where there may be interventions that are needed in much, and resources are, much, are needed in much greater degree. So um, I think we just have to wait and see. We have to see how many tests are actually released, where those hot pockets are, um, whether we actually end up revising the guidelines to specific areas of the country is really up for question at the moment. We just, we don't know. We're just trying to do our best to do what's right. So uh, there is uh, questions about sort of the functions of our clinic. So uh, there are a number of questions about whether our, uh, we're recommending that uh, centers or uh, clinics uh, still allow patients to proceed with diagnostic procedures, blood work, uh, pictures and the like, uh, uh, and uh, or is the focus strictly to a no, con tele, uh, no contact telemedicine visit? And if so, you know, the who will approve the opening of clinics and what criteria will be used? Uh, I think uh, those are somewhat linked questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So I think the, uh, you know, the answer is we're discouraged, the task force is discouraging uh, physical management of patients, physical interaction, that is not urgent. Uh, so uh, obviously there are ways to try and mitigate, again, no, no safety guarantee. Those, those methods would require uh, not only distancing, but maybe both the patients and all the staff wearing masks uh, because it can be transmitted in the asymptomatic uh, time frame. And obviously the concern is that may make it safer, but you're using uh, available resources that frontline people in hospitals have, you know, have difficulty getting. So at, at, I think at the present time, the recommendation of the task force is to avoid doing treatments that are not, that are not emergency type treatments. What about um, who's going to order the clinics or who's going to mandate that the clinics be opened or uh, who determines that? So, I mean, I, I think it's important to reiterate that, as Kevin said, 
the documents that the ASRM task force are producing have not gone through the normal process of membership, surveillance and critique. These are, these are recommendations, they're guidance documents that are providing recommendations. We're not, and we can't mandate anything. Again, and I, I don't want to, to be too sort of sensitive and emotional about this, but this is just about doing the right thing. It's not about when can we do this because we want to do it. It's really about when should we do this, given what's happening in our immediate environment, in our state, and in our nation. So again, these are not uh, regulations. I mean, this, I'm English, as you know, <laughs> um, and you know, in England we we abide by regulations. Americans don't like regulations. They they will go with guidelines, but this isn't even these aren't even guidelines. It's a guidance document with recommendations that, as a group of experts, we felt was the right thing to do. I hope that answers the question adequately. Although, frankly, it, it's hard to imagine uh, doing procedures that could fit into an elective category um, in a state where elective procedures uh, have been either precluded or prevented by governor's executive order. And, and frankly, um, I would hate to think about what the liability would be if anyone were harmed by infection. Um, your your workers were harmed by infection uh, or another adverse outcome to occur when you weren't following the guidance of either the state or a professional organization. Yes, I, I agree. And the guidance in Texas, so we've had we've had um, you know documents produced by our Texas Medical Board uh, and produced from the governor that that tend to fit. You know, as I interpret it, tend to fit with the ASRM's guidance document. Um, on the other hand, there are some some clinics that I'm aware of that that interpret these um, these different ways. So, thank you. Uh, there are some questions around uh, masks, NP95 uh, masks, uh, commenting that NP95 masks tend to filter particles that are 0.3 uh, microns or uh, or uh, larger, but uh, that the viral particles we are talking about are about 0.1 microns. Uh, how is that then that MP59 masks are effective? And then secondly, of course, uh, why aren't uh, people just making their own masks? What, what's so special about uh, these masks? So N95 masks um, are designed with an electrostatic layer that basically captures viral particles, as you alluded to, Ricardo, down to 0.1 microns in size. There are other masks which have similar uh, numbers, like KN95 or NP95, and those are generally not considered the same level or same protection as N95, which most people use in healthcare centers for protection against viral infection. N95 is really the standard. Yeah, the, so the virus is smaller, but it's usually carried on droplets or micro droplets, and those are, are large enough to get filtered out by, by masks, usually. Now, in terms of uh, using homemade masks, homemade masks and any surgical, sort of standard surgical mask, are good for decreasing droplets coming out of someone's mouth. So it's good to prevent you from infecting someone else but it is not a filtering mechanism. N95 is a tight fit filtering mechanism so that all of the air has to go through the mask itself. It cannot go around the mask. And that's again, why the filtration component is important. Thank you. There's a number of questions around how to manage uh, patients who require urgent uh, fertility care, oncofertility and so on. Uh, and if the clinics are being closed uh, or are closed, uh, how are those being uh, managed? So, so I, I'll tackle that from um, our experience at Brigham Women's Hospital. So we have stopped all patients doing regular IVF. Um, however, we are open. The lab is open to take care of these urgent cases. And we actually have, I think, a retrieval in a couple of days for a cancer patient. Um, so for a small freestanding clinic um, who might be actually uh, have a population of patients that need to have urgent fertility preservation, I would uh, 
assume that there might be, and hope that there might be an opportunity for the patient to be referred to a larger um, clinic that might have the uh, lab still open. Uh, as, you, as you probably noted in the guidance, we made it very clear that these urgent cases, such as for gonotoxic therapy and fertility preservation, should be allowed to go, uh, to go forward for the obvious reasons. Yes, and, and, and I would say that it, these embryologists and the staff, they're not like they're fired typically or they're taking jobs doing you know, carpentry or plumbing, they're still out there. And if you, as long as you keep your uh, laboratory open and you need to, to maintain your liquid nitrogen and the safety of your gametes and embryos, you've still got these um, highly skilled personnel that can, that can be called in to, to handle these cases. I don't, I don't think typically um, that that's going to be a problem, even in freestanding um, IVF clinics. And the ASRM task force guidance supports maintaining essential services and having adequate personnel to do that. Right. And by adequate personnel, I will just um, add to that, Peter, if I may. So I think probably one should think in, in, with respect to adequate personnel, there should be a minimum of two people in the lab at all times, um, just for obvious safety reasons and for double checks on the IDs of the specimens to make sure that things are done absolutely watertight. Yeah. Thank you. So how do uh, the ASRM guidelines uh, or actually recommendations uh, compare to those of other uh, medical specialty societies, uh, orthopedics, uh, ophthalmology, and so on? I can't answer that. Can either of you guys? So, so I think all of those specialties have, have stopped their, and, and the word elective was mentioned before, and that's kind of a hot button word, but, but they've stopped doing non-urgent care. So I'm aware that, uh, that, that sometimes people can't get lithotripsy for their kidney stones or they can't get their cataract surgery. Uh, so things that are of an urgent uh, nature where time really is of the essence, those are generally uh, not excluded by these other associations. I think we're right in line. Uh, and when you look at those other associations like the American College of Surgeons, they actually have an entire series of tiers of uh, urgency where, frankly, only the highest level emergency or urgent procedures are being done. So I should add uh, that we, uh, uh, ASRM, is uh, a member of the Council of Medical Specialty Society, CMSS. Uh, and so CMSS is, uh, uh, as, a, as a group, uh, covers uh, more than 800,000 physicians and 45 specialties, and uh, all of these societies uh, have basically similar uh, statements around uh, elective uh, or non-urgent uh, procedures, uh, uh, around delaying uh, anything that is not an emergency uh, during this period of time. So in fact, uh, the vast majority of our sister societies have taken exactly the same position that uh, that uh, we at ASRM have done as well. Uh, there is a sure. number of uh, questions, and I think this will be our last question because we're well uh, past our time, but I do think it's important. Lots of uh, questions about uh, geographic uh, uh, and locale. Uh, should we be considering uh, uh, individual localities, uh, geography, places, uh, uh, rather than sort of a general kind of, uh, of, uh, of recommendation. So, so I would say, I think that was considered at the outset and, and the wisest move was to be uniform about it. And I think it will be considered when we're on the other side of this as well, so. Well, and I think one of the things that we recognized when disease spread outside of China, it was very quickly recognized that the United States is a very mobile, and very free um, set of communities. And the exchange of disease amongst those communities, unfortunately, is very rapid. So as we're seeing throughout the country, there'll be little hot spots, but frankly, I think it will be a period of time before that is settled to the point where we're really safe. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and all of those who attended and sent questions in Thank you our, uh, to our speakers for taking time to do this. Thank you very much, Sarah, to you.
Thank you, um, Dr. Aziz. So thank you to our presenters, our moderator and attendees. Um, you will receive a survey by email after this session. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant content. Your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please keep an eye out for the announcement of our next webinar. Um, for any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at asrm.org. This concludes the webinar. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Good night.